perfect summer vacation. Seeing Italy by bicycle. Then there's the other way to see Italy by bicycle. But this is no vacation. This is the 69th running of the Giro d'Italia, the Tour of Italy, along with the Tour de France, the most prestigious professional cycling race in the world. 22 days of hell on wheels. The Giro d'Italia, Tour of Italy. This is Morona, Italy. Today, this rather small resort town near the Austrian border plays host to the last chapter of an event that yearly captures the fancy of a sports mad nation. The Giro d'Italia, or Tour of Italy, is a 22-day odyssey that literally covers the width and breadth of the entire country of Italy. It ends here today in Verona. What that means is that the newspapers can now stop writing about this and go back to more mundane things, like world events. You know, I've had a chance to cover an awful lot of cycling events over the years, including the Olympic Games. I have really never come across one like this. Every day is an event. Every night is a carnival. And it's what really amounts to being the Indianapolis of the Kentucky Derby, the Super Bowl, and the World Series, all wrapped into one madcap package that managed to put an entire nation on its end. That's what the Giro d'Italia is all about. And for the person who wins it, well, it means more than just hero worship. It means enough of that to make a rock star jealous. It means big bucks. It means literally millions of dollars in contracts and in endorsements and that sort of thing. It means the world to win this race. It's an event that started 2,500 miles ago and 22 days ago on the island of Sicily. Through the heat of an early summer and up the western coast of the mainland with the first signs of the mountains to come, and then across the country and up the south coast before heading north through Potenza and up to the Atlantic, again through the heart of the country, east of Rome, finally up the Adriatic, back again across Italy, through historic Siena, north along the Italian Riviera, and then through mountains of the north, all up and then all descent through some of the most picturesque terrain on earth. Finally, through the Dolomites to this resort town that now provides the final chapter. One other note about the Giro d'Italia and this type of cycling event. It is not at all an individual sport. This is a team sport. There are nine members on each of the 19 teams here, 171 cyclists in all participating. And the interesting thing, unlike other team sports, there's only one star. It's rather like show business. The star gets the headlines but he needs the supporting cast. It's the role of the other eight individuals on a team to make sure that their man, their number one, gets home first. That's what it's all about. It's crazy. It's a 22-day party. Here's what I mean. The Super Bowl on Wheels is probably the best way to describe an event of this magnitude. Each day for more than three weeks, the men, women, and children of Italy line the roads throughout the entire country. These are the roads traveled by their heroes, and even though they will pass a matter of seconds, the fans leave satisfied that they have been witness to something special. 1986 marks the 69th running of the Giro d'Italia. Except for improved bicycles and more racers, there have been few changes in this classic sporting event through the years. The most impressive aspect of the Giro is the adoration the Italian people have for the sport. It's more than just cheering for your favorite. Fans worship the racers. They paint their names on roads, newly paved just for the Giro. They dress like their favorite cyclists. They make signs, and they create paintings, just hoping to inspire victory. Equally as incredible are the obstacles spectators will overcome just to catch a glimpse of the Giro as the cyclists speed by. They'll travel for miles and weather hours in the snow, rain, and extreme heat. On the economic side, the Giro proves to be a gold mine for souvenir vendors, individual entrepreneurs, and the host towns. However, reports indicate the race actually costs Italian industry millions of dollars each year. You see the factories and most offices closed just so workers can watch the race. The Giro d'Italia is the biggest sporting event in Italy. Even for those who have experienced the race, it defies comparison. There's nothing like it, you know. Americans just don't know it's something that's taking off, but <laughs> we're centuries behind. The 69th Giro d'Italia begins when we return.
In the long history of the Giro d'Italia, only nine winners have not been Italian. In Italy, they like their bike racing fast and tough, and their champions, home bred. This year, one of the favorites is American Greg LeMond. After finishing third in last year's Giro, only victory will suit him. In 1985, La Vie Claire team leader, French champion Bernard Eno won the Giro, and then won the Tour de France, all at the expense of Greg LeMond. Eno chose not to race this year's Giro, leaving LeMond without the kind of team necessary to win. But it was more than a loss to Vino. LeMond would have to face being locked in competition with 14 Italian teams, all determined to keep the leader's pink jersey in Italy. To say Mosier and bicycle racing in the same breath is redundant. Even though on the eve of retirement, Francesco Mosier, Checo to his fans, is compelled by pride and determination to add another Giro victory to his already impressive biography. Giuseppe Cerrone is another Italian, primed to win. Cerrone likes the way he looks in pink and wants his third Giro victory. He would like nothing more than to beat the American, Greg LeMond. Roberto Vizzantini, the racer with the matinee idol looks, has had to deal with unrelenting criticism from the Italian public. Although always a favorite to win, he's never fulfilled his potential. More bad luck. A month ago, Vizzantini broke his arm. He'll race the Giro, determined to silence his critics and overcome his personal misfortune. As the story unfolds, my colleague Greg Lewis joins us. Barry, after the hundreds of days of preparation and thousands of hours of training, the racers finally faced their first test. But this friendly little prologue to the Tour of Italy may only lull the racers into a false sense of confidence. The first time trout less than a mile along a flat, smooth Palermo street did not tell the tale of what was to come. This crowded and busy Sicilian city provided the perfect contrast to the beauty and peacefulness of the countryside that makes up the first 84-mile stage. The racer's strategy at this point was watch and wait. Who's in shape, who's anxious, and who'll set the pace? Easy days like this are good to work out the kinks and help the racers prepare for the 21 days to come. For Le Mans, these early stages enable him to cycle into shape and begin the process of working with his new teammates. The start of a stage of the Giro, a sea of color, fancy equipment of enough commercialism to make Madison Avenue gag. The faces of the competitors known to all the thousands and even millions who line this race course from beginning to end for a 22-day run. But for one of the most well-known of the cyclists here on the continent, European popularity gives way to American anonymity. His name is Greg Lamond. In the United States, his fame is limited mostly to bicycle shops and the area around his hometown of Reno, Nevada. But here in Europe, he is a star of sport, known by everyone. Not only because he's America's greatest cyclist of all time, but also because he's a world champion. Every child loves a bicycle, but for this cycling hero, nicknamed in his early years the Reno Rocket, this love for bicycles propelled him to international fame. Well, in the winter of, uh, I believe it was 75, Greg was training for freestyle and there was no snow in the Sierra because of the drought. So he started riding a bike and uh, coming to the local training races. And uh, I guess the first two races he won. And he was 15 years old and he was beating riders, that were experienced riders. Um, and right from the beginning, I could tell the guy possessed natural talent. It was just obvious to me he was going to be a champion. All the things he's doing now, he knew he wanted to do that when he was 15. And I don't know how he knew it, but I know that when he was 15 or 16, he was interviewed by a cycling magazine. And he said, I want to be a big star someday and make a lot of money. And, and that's what he's doing. At 25, Greg is regarded as one of the true superstars of pro cycling. He's easily the greatest American cyclist in history, currently ranked among the top three racers in the world. In 1983, Greg won the World Championships of Pro Road Racing. His remarkable season of 1985 included his second Tours Classic title, and he came within a coach's decision of winning the Tour de France. 
Some say Le Mans was born with his cycling ability, but this sport demands more than just natural talent. There are, genetically speaking, uh, some advantages some riders have, and that means a bigger heart, uh, bigger lungs. But uh, the thing is, when you get into world-class competition, there's, I'm not the only one. There's 100 riders like me. So it's th then it's the determination and, and, uh, uh, and the uh, confidence and everything that takes you to the top. Cycling to the top was how it all began for Greg. He grew up just outside Reno, surrounded by the majestic Sierra Nevada. As a young athlete, Greg pedaled up the steep slopes to stay in shape, and looking back, the mountains played an important role in the success of his career. In cycling in Europe, the, the most crucial point of, of racing is climbing, and I've had climbing mountains, and growing up my whole life, I, I had that opportunity to ride in the mountains and train at altitude, and uh, uh, it made my life, even in America, it was much more difficult training than, say, the average American was used to, so I think it prepared me a lot for uh, professional racing in Europe. Greg's career move from amateur to pro meant leaving his home in America and settling in Europe. He now lives where they worship cyclists, the way Americans worship football stars, where cycling becomes most competitive and the sport becomes a career. Most people never in America have never seen real bicycle racing. The big races are like a, a real battle. I mean, uh, uh, it's a really a hard, hard sport. Cycling is not a sport where you can just be a good athlete or a great athlete and with a little training or a year's training expect to come over here and race the Tour de France or the Tour of Italy and win it. It takes a lot of investment. That means turning professional or racing in Europe when you're 19, 20 years old, uh, getting experience for three or four years before you can even consider winning a race like the Tour de France. Because of Greg's tremendous success, new interest in cycling is appearing in the U.S. Also, previously locked doors have been opened for other American cyclists to enter European pro racing. Houston breaking, breaking the way for the rest of us, you know. He's actually putting, put in the sacrifices that we haven't had to do, and, you know, I think all the Americans are pretty thankful for that because he, in the first couple years, he had it pretty hard. Fierce determination and patience have paid off handsomely for Le Mans. A four-year, $1.4 million contract to ride on the French La Vie Claire team and unlimited racing potential for at least 10 more years means this smiling American could well go on to become the greatest bike racer the world has ever seen. And a cycling fan is like no other in the world. Watching the racers ready themselves for the second stage, the fans see the toll this race can take. The Giro had sent its first warning. The early summer heat of the Sicilian countryside had no effect on this pack of world-class athletes. This stage's team strategy dictates the riders stick together in the peloton, the race's largest group of riders. While the racers methodically pedal toward the finish at Catania, the fans who had arrived five hours earlier grabbed at the free ice cream bars to help beat the heat. As the racers approach the final miles, as expected, a breakaway occurred. Giovanni Botoya made a move for the TV cameras and for his team. However, in the surge to catch the last-minute breakaway, disaster struck. Greg LeMond was trapped by racers falling in his path. Yeah, at the moment, yeah, but it's losing time that's the most important. In a race like the Giro, the most important days are the mountain stages and the time trials. Stage three was a 31-mile team time trial. Del Tongo Conago dominates the day. Giuseppe Del Tongo Conago dominates the day. Giuseppe Cerrone and his team used this time trial to take the overall lead, while Le Mans' La Vie Claire team finished a distant one minute and 41 seconds behind. Did La Vie Claire field the best team possible for the Tour of Italy, or did the Frenchman he know and coach Paul Coakley leave Le Mans to fend for himself? 
only time will tell.